she still prefers paper maps so she can see the entire course of the journey. Our lives are like a road map in many ways. There's a beginning and an end, and how we get between these destinations is important. I don't want to waste my life by getting lost along the way and potentially wasting the precious time that I'm allowed on earth. The words of Jesus in John 14, 6 remind me how God loves me enough to provide me with a map of life. Jesus invites me into a relationship, but more than that, Jesus' words and teaching show me the way forward. They help me to live a life that is transformed through a relationship with my Creator who loves me and invites me into eternal life. So I have come to see life as an exciting road trip with Jesus as my guide and strength, helping me day by day. Let us pray. Our Father, thank you for giving us Jesus as the way and the life. Amen. Walk with us on this journey of life and transform us our, to live lives of love modeled after Jesus. Amen. 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 Father Perry, who was a longtime member of this class, mm -hmm. I remember um, as a young adult uh, uh, visiting this class with him. Gee, I think way back in the, am I, I feel like I'm echoing, uh, way back in the early 80s, uh, quite frankly, um, and um, I did visit with him often when I came home on vacations and everything. And then when I joined this church in 2009, I attended with him for a while. Um, and then I decided to visit uh, Robbie Park's class because Robbie is a contemporary of mine. Actually, Robbie and I grew up together at um, what used to be Hendrix Memorial United Methodist Church, which has uh, its origin with this church, actually. They split way back in the day in the early 1950s and uh, Hendricks Memorial ended up on Spring Park Road. It's now Faith, um, United Methodist Church, and Southside came here. So anyway, uh, Robbie was quite the rascal, I will tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, as, a, as a, a divorced individual moving back to Jacksonville um, in the uh, early 2000s, I um, was amazed. I had a conversation with Pastor Gail once, and I said, I don't know what got a hold of him, but wow, you know. <laughs> uh, but anyway, he's a, he's a wonderful person and, um, and loves the Lord. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, I am uh, pleased to be here. Um, again, uh, uh, I do have uh, two adult children. I have a 38-year-old daughter who lives in the Panhandle. Um, and runs a horse boarding farm. Her husband is an air traffic controller at Edlin. And so uh, they live over there and they have two boys. Um, I was not here three weeks ago because it was the younger's third birthday and he's just started attending uh, Mother's Day Out and he was stopped up and coughing. And so anyway, as soon as I got home, I got I got really sick. <laughs> Those little little people germs, viruses are bad things. But anyway, I've sort of been under the weather um, and just now kind of starting to feel myself again. And then my son is still here in town. 
Uh, he married in 2020 and has a 15-month-old and is due another one in March. And it's going to be a girl. So I, I finally, I finally <laughs> get my granddaughter. So, so anyway, um, my brother Tim still lives here in town. He lives in a group home on the west side, an ARC group home. And I visit him quite often and uh, sort of you know, monitor his situation. And then my younger sister, Kim, who has attended some Bible studies with me, um, has Parkinson's disease. And so I not only have my own children to take care of now, but I have my siblings. And it's, but it's an honor. It's an honor, so uh, I don't want that to sound like I feel like it's a burden at all. I don't. But if I'm not here some Sundays, it's usually a family-related uh, issue. Anyway, um, I want to start this morning a little differently. Um, our lesson, uh, our whole lesson, the series of lessons this quarter has been on God's exceptional choice, and we're kind of changing focus now during the month of November, um, and we'll get back to that in a minute. But the way I want to start is I want us to think, considering our current American culture, um, I want us to make a list of some, what we would think as, we can use words, phrases, uh, images of what constitutes success according to our current, current culture. So I, I, I thought about it and made a list and see if, if nobody feels like uh, participating or whatever, but I would be glad to hear from you. Mm -hmm. First, I think of integrity. Integrity. Mm -hmm. All right, well, that definitely wasn't on my list. <laughs> because we know, unfortunately, a lot of people in our society who don't have a lot of, of integrity are considered successful, right? Okay, what else? God positive attitudes. Positive attitude. See, I can tell this group is a half glass full group. <laughs> God first. Because that's not at all what I what I can play. Now, this is in, in, in light of a current American culture, right? Um, current American culture. What we think it should be. Okay, well, that's totally different because we are set apart, are we not? That's right. To think well, differently, right? How, okay, so. How, hmm? how are we set apart? We are saved by God, and we are therefore part of the, part of the family of God. That's what this whole lesson is about. Is that incompatible with Peter? Oh, no, it's not incompatible, but it's, it is incompatible in many ways with current American culture. Yes. So let me just tell you some of the things I came up with. Images. Images of success in America today. Uh, luxury real estate. Yes. Expensive cars. Material things, uh, jewelry, you know, brand names like Rolex pop into my mind, uh, diamonds, furs. Not that those are bad things, you know, not that they're bad things in themselves, but when we see those things, we, I, I at least think to myself, man, that person is certainly successful if they can afford. So back again, who hollered out money and wealth? Money and wealth in our, is valued. Is, 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 is a sign of success, okay? So I'm gonna switch this over here a minute, and I'm gonna put wealth, because, you know, you have to be wealthy to afford some of those things I talked about, right? Can you ask the initial question again? Yeah, I was coming up with images to images, begin with, uh, yes, images to begin with, of, uh, of what we would consider success. I but mean, we can I talk here. Mm -hmm. Going along with wealth, I, I look at it a little bit differently. Success to me would be one of our freedom would freedom from want. If you can work and, and just be where you you don't you feel secure. Okay, you very don't good. Think you're gonna be hungry or okay, so home. let me just put maybe financial security. How about that? 
Okay. Okay, some of the other things we think about is maybe lifetime achievement awards in all kinds of areas. Or what came to my mind, like let's say in business. Or, well, actually, in, in a lot of different areas of study, what about the Nobel Peace Prize? Or the Nobel Prize? The Nobel Prize in any area is, is, is a sign of achievement, lifetime achievement. Mm -hmm. really. I don't think it is anymore. No, in, the no, past, no. in the past, it was. That's right. They gave Barack Obama Nobel Peace Prize right. for getting elected. Okay. Well, I don't want to get into politics here. So, um, but, I, but I was thinking about in the past, at least that was quite an honor. Also, I think being a Fortune 500 company in business yeah. is something that some people you know, strive for. Let's look at, I'm going to stop writing and just talk, I guess. Um, I think about athletics. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have Olympic gold, right? We have uh, the Super Bowl uh, trophy and the, and the, the rings. The Heisman. We have the Heisman. The Heisman. Oh, yeah. In college, that's definitely a big thing. Hey, winning the National College Championship, yeah. that's a big thing. Um, we have uh, in baseball, what, the World Series pennant, you win the pennant. Is it soccer that's the World Cup? I mean the Stanley Cup? What is the Stanley Cup? I think that's soccer. soccer. Anyway, we have all of these awards that people earn. Uh, golly, in entertainment, we could go on and on. We have the Tonys, we have the uh, Academy, we have Oscar. the Emmys. Yeah, the Oscar. We have uh, the Emmys, we have the Grammys, we have, okay? So these are signs of success and life achievement for a lot of our culture, right? You've made it if you earn one of those. Um, let's talk about then some what we call winning qualities. Qualities in people that are valued. Now, you, this is, yes, we start, this is a big one right here, integrity, personal integrity, positive attitude, patriotism, all, all things that we value. But uh, in culture, a lot of times, like what, what came to my mind was, uh, if you're beautiful, if you're thin, yeah, uh, if you're young, because there is, uh, the older I get, the more I realize that there is ageism out there, right? Right, over the hill is, yes. Okay, so, so those things, if you are intelligent, if you're innovative, I think of people not particularly beautiful, but names that come to my mind in that category are uh, Musk, Gates, Jobs, uh, Zuckerberg, you know, not, 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 not head turners when you pass them on the street, but definitely, you know, okay. And then, um, so I could go on and on about our modern culture, okay? Now the question that I want to pose after all that is, let me turn to my lesson here, is how does our criteria, and we're, we're set apart, we're different, I get, for choosing a winner or determining success affect how we see ourselves and how we interact with others? So, do we measure ourselves, I'm not talking about here at church, but out and about in society, do we consider ourselves successful in life? Or can we look back on our lives at some point and feel like we achieved what we um, desired to achieve um, in, in this culture? From, the, from this standpoint. And you know, when it says, how did it affect you? I'll just give you a really quick example. Okay. Um, I am not beautiful. I don't consider myself beautiful. I don't turn heads on the street. I've met women who do, and I've admired their beauty, but that's not me. Uh, I'm not uh, particularly athletic. I mean, I walk and, you know, try to take care of myself, but I've never 
been on an athletic team and competed in sports, anything like that. And I, I wasn't particularly popular. And what I'm thinking about is in middle school and high school, I always dreamed of trying out for cheerleading. But I never did because of all those things. I didn't consider myself pretty enough, athletic enough, or popular enough to win. So I didn't even try. And you, you may have experienced that sometime in your life, maybe in your career or something like that, or you know of a young person today that is experiencing that, okay? So there are some positives to that kind, those kinds of pressures because our Olympic uh, athletes and other, uh, some, some winners in other sports to achieve that kind of success push themselves to limits that we never imagined, you know? Um, and we do it in all kinds of areas, um, in medicine, aerospace, all kinds of things. We're always pushing the limits. So, so sometimes that, that, that is good, but a lot of times uh, it's not. So today what we are going to do is expand beyond what we would call worldly, uh, what the world thinks uh, of success or the worldly lens to a more godly lens. Okay, now I'm finally going to get into the lesson. This is my problem because I, I, I should have said, hey, if you don't want to do music or devotion, I can talk the full I can always do that. I was always getting in trouble in graduate school because they set a time limit, you know, on your presentation, and I was always like, you know. Anyway, um, I want to mention just real quickly, again, uh, the um, title of this, uh, the course of this lesson is God's Exceptional Choice. And what we're going to come to, what we have seen in the people that God chose, mostly out of the Old Testament, those are the ones that we've highlighted, were not exceptional in the way American culture, or you know, our present culture, sees exceptional. Uh, they were exceptional in that they were chosen, kind of not what the crowd of their day would choose to be leaders and things like that. Maybe Saul is the only one, because he was tall, dark, and handsome. When Samuel chose him, everybody's going, yeah, 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 he'll be a good king. And he was for a while. But anyway, um, uh, so we'll keep all those people in mind, but now we're going to be moving to the New Testament. Another one that, that was chosen, that would, would not have been expected at all, was Saul, who turned Paul, uh, who became known as Paul. And we are going to be studying our scripture lesson today is out of Ephesians. Uh, Pastor Dale just did a whole semester on Ephesians back in uh, the fall. So I did reread today's lesson in uh, that book. Um, his focus was a little bit different, not, not, not a lot, but um, his focus was on the church, uh, who are the people of God or the children of God. This lesson focuses on uh, something a little bit different. So if it's okay with you, I'm going to um, read the scripture lesson. And then I'm, I've just highlighted a few, um, a few of, the, of the discussion, a few things in the discussion. Um, and I hope that you will bear with me. Some of them I'm going to sort of read because I, these are things that, that jumped out at me, and I don't think I can articulate them any better than the author. The author really did a really good job, but I'm not, I won't read them all. Okay, here's our, here's our scripture lesson for today. It comes from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. And I will say that one of the things that, that I did not know uh, that the author uh, of this lesson shared was that when Paul originally wrote this letter, he wrote verses 1 through 14 in a single sentence. <laughs> it was a single sentence. And so uh, he must have been overjoyed and really wanting to share uh, this doctrine, okay, um, that we are going to talk about today. Okay, 
So we start out, uh, Paul, an apostle of Christ, uh, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. To the praise of his glorious grace which he has given freely to us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ. To be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession, to the praise of his glory. Okay. And that was all one sentence in the Greek. <laughs> um, okay. So the first thing I wanted to point out that I learned new, I always learn something new when I'm doing studying the Bible, is how many of you knew that a Roman apostle was an official messenger who conveyed messages from authority figures to the public? I don't think I ever really knew what an apostle was. I mean, I knew Peter was an apostle. I know Paul was an apostle. You know, you know the, all of the disciples became apostles after Jesus death they were the and resurrection they were the original ones and then Paul um, felt like he had a special calling um, but I, I never knew that's kind of where that word came from so we have official messenger who conveyed messages from authority figures Paul is the apostle in this case from who Jesus. from Jesus Jesus called him on the road to Damascus right mm -hmm. right Okay, um, to the public. In this case, his particular Peter and the other disciples, well, I don't know about all of them, but Peter in particular and James and some of the others tended to stay pretty much in Judea and in Palestine and um, uh, with the church there, with the original church in Jerusalem and in that area. Paul and Barnabas and some of the others, they were dispatched. They, they were given the mission to the Gentiles. So that was sort of Paul's, he felt like his special calling, okay? All right, so, um, oh, and then the other thing that's important too is that he does talk here, um, the second part of the greeting is to God's holy people. A lot of ancient authorities don't include in Ephesus. Um, God's holy people, the faithful in Christ Jesus, so uh, a lot of biblical scholars feel like this was what they called a general letter that maybe started in Ephesus, was read originally in Ephesus, and then circulated among some of the other uh, believers and churches in, in Asia Minor in the area. And it's different, too, because Ephesians actually does address doctrine, what we believe, what we have faith in as followers of Jesus Christ. 
and not problems and concerns. In a lot of the other church, there were very specific problems going on that Peter, uh, Peter, that Paul addressed, not in Ephesians. So that's why a lot of people think this was kind of a general letter that may have started in Ephesus and then gone elsewhere. Um, and that's about all I'm going to say about that. Oh, I did want to say something about holy people and the faithful in Christ Jesus. I thought this was a really good note that the author made. Paul used this phrasing to emphasize that Gentiles were welcomed into faith in Jesus on equal standing with their Jewish brothers and sisters who had also accepted Christ. It was not enough or even necessary to claim heritage in Abraham, although if you'll remember, um, Abraham was way before Moses and therefore the law and Yahweh, you know, and, and uh, uh, the Israelites, okay? So there is a passage in Genesis that says, um, God, or the Spirit of God, spoke to Abraham, and even though he lived in Ur, one of, or maybe the most, metropolitan city in Mesopotamia, he picked up and went where? To Canaan. So he left a very lucrative and um, comfortable and safe life to journey off into no man's land, uh, no. you know, kind of, yes, and journey off into the unknown, um, listening and acting on the word of God. And there's a passage in there that says something to the effect that Abram, who then became Abraham, believed God, and it was accounted to him as what? Righteous. Righteousness. So here's the first time we hear belief, belief, belief in God, and now in the New Covenant, belief in Jesus Christ and God's plan of salvation for mankind separates us from the rest of the world. I mean, you know, you know what I mean, okay? Okay. So, I thought that was very good. And then it says, because faith was and is the primary condition for determining whether one is part of the faithful, the lives of believers are different even out of place in the world, because our identity is found in Christ, not in human families, clans, or nations. Right? That's right. Okay. All right. Very well said, I thought. Okay. So, um, the next part I really want to look at starts in um, verse 4. And this is where, for, for he chose... For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Okay. Um, here's another point that the author brings up. I don't know how many of you had a chance to actually read the lesson in the book. Some of this is in the lesson, some of it is not. So I may be repeating some of what you've read. But it says, um, before the creation of the world, that, that phrase focuses on God's everlasting plan. Now let's think about that. Before the creation of the world focuses on God's everlasting plan. Though God's choosing us may seem like a statement of predestination, and actually that word is used later, right? Predestination. It is actually a much broader statement of God's loving intent for all people. We were all meant to be holy and blameless in his sight. Amen. Think about the Garden of Eden and Adam, Adam and Eve, how they had this close personal relationship, an intimate relationship with God. They walked with him every day and talked with him every day, right? That's how God wanted things to be and still does, quite frankly. <laughs> anyway, um, let's see, where was I? Oh, yeah. Okay, the fall threw all people into a sinful tailspin outside of God's good plan. But God was unwilling to let sin take its natural course and condemn all people to death. So God set in motion the plan that would call us back to him in love. Jesus was that plan. And through his death, he conquered both sin and death, doing what he could 
doing what we could not accomplish for ourselves. We tried that with the law, right? Yeah. Yes, we tried that with the law. Not that the law is a bad thing. Paul says it actually, the law teaches us the difference between right and wrong, right? Okay, but we cannot obey the law 100% of the time. We just can't because we are fallen and we live in a fallen world. And we know that. We commit sins every day, knowingly sometimes, and not, and not even knowingly, right? By making a premature and harsh judgment against someone without really knowing their situation or their circumstances, right? Those kinds of things. But anyway, and through his death, he conquered both sin and death, doing what we could not accomplish for ourselves. Our status changes as a result. We are counted as being holy. Sins washed away. We've been redeemed. We've been forgiven. I think um, somewhere, probably in one of the prophets, my goal next year is when I come across a verse like this, I actually write it down. <laughs> Because I cannot ever remember where they are. But they're somewhere where God says, I will remember their sins no more. Right? Washed away. Don't even remember them. Okay. We are counted as being holy, set apart in a godly way and without blame, having our sins forgiven. This is the only way we can have a relationship with God, that we can approach God. Okay? He's... Sin separates us from God, alienates us from him, okay? We gain these attributes because of God's efforts through Christ. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I thought somebody had something to add. No? Okay. All right. So the next part it says, he predestined us, here's that word again, for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. Commentary. Predestined echoes God's pre-creation choice for people, which we just talked about, okay? I'm saying okay a lot. I'm sorry. Some scholars believe this means that everyone's eternal status was decided by God before anyone was born. Anyone grow a Presbyterian? <laughs> anyone read Calvin? Anyway, some people do believe that. However, we should not fall into, that's called fatalism. The belief that free will does not exist, that we can make no choices that influence the outcome. God has chosen us by grace. What does grace mean? Unmerited favor. In other words, we cannot earn it by following the law to the letter as hard as we try or by good works, right? We cannot earn our salvation. It is a free gift of God through grace. Unmerited favor. Unconditional love. We must choose him. We must choose him through our faith. Okay, so let me read that one again. God has chosen us by his grace. We must choose him through our faith. Okay. Now we know that God is omniscient. So because he knows the future, and we do not, he may know who ultimately will choose and who will not. But we don't. So what do we do? We share God's love with everyone. Yeah? Right? Okay. The emphasis here is not on predestination but on adoption. God's plan to adopt humans as his children in holiness was fulfilled only in Jesus Christ. Nothing that happened around Christ's coming or in his ministry, death, and resurrection was haphazard, a fluke, or a mistake. This act of loving mercy is described as coming from his pleasure and will. Why? Because God wants close, personal, intimate relationships with each one of us. Okay? Our adoption is not done grudgingly or under compulsion. God's desire is for us to be reconciled to him, to be included among his people. Inclusion into God's family is a marvelous demonstration of God's love. 
Christ is the Son of God in a unique way, but God's love is extended to all who believe and are adopted as sons and daughters in Christ. Our adoption results in full acceptance as children of God and all of the rights of an heir. Have you ever thought of yourself as, or have you ever thought of Jesus, the Son of God, as perhaps your big brother? Mm -hmm. Really? Absolutely. And, it's, and that's stated in, in many ways in the New Testament. The first of a large family, you know, that's how God wants it. So God the Father, you know, wants that, and, and as well as the Son, and we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit here in just a minute. But um, it gives me great comfort <laughs> to know that even though I can't save myself, I have somebody up there that did what Jesus did, an older brother now, that did what Jesus did for me, and continues to advocate and intercede for me every day when I mess up. So I don't know, that, that, that means a lot. That means a lot to me, it means, means a great deal. Um, okay, I wanted to say something about the Holy Spirit in here, and then I want to say something about, uh, let, me just, let me just go on here. Okay, so we've talked about redemption through his blood and redemption, redemption and, and forgiveness of sins um, is what we believe and which saves us and we can't save ourselves. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ uh, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on, and on earth under Christ. Um, there is a passage, I think, in Romans that talks about um, that creation itself was uh, committed to futility after the fall. So it's not just humans who live in a fallen world, but all of creation and how creation itself, God loves everything that he created. So he is anxious for this to happen so that he can bring unity to all things that he created. And that also means um, uh, the unity of mankind uh, among the believers. So it doesn't matter, you know, um, what age you are, what gender you are, what nationality you are, what your political persuasion is what your economic status, what religious denomination you belong to. If you believe and have faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are adopted into the family of God, and, um, and we are, we're all one, one. And that, in this book, is the church, with Christ as the head, when we study. Do you remember that, Bill? Yeah. Okay. The other thing I want to bring up just real quick here is the verses that, that talk about the Holy Spirit. It said, when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, um, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. So basically what this means is, um, number one, the Holy Spirit uh, authenticates uh, our belief and faith and uh, comes to us as sort of a deposit or first installment while, we, while we're still here on the riches that we can anticipate in heaven, in the heavenly places, in the heaven, heavenly realms, as Paul calls it. The Spirit is a gift promising more gifts to come. Through the Holy Spirit, believers experience God's presence and power now. A taste of what we will experience in full when Christ returns. The future holds not only the final defeat of sin and its effects, but also spiritual fulfillment and completion. So, um, And then the, the way I, I want to sort of uh, end this is with a... 
a couple of questions for us to think about. Um, first of all, um, with, with this in mind, and you may want to go home and, and reread those first few verses in uh, Ephesians chapter 1, but, but it asks just to think about what is your identity in Christ? And how does our understanding of our identity in, Christ, in Jesus Christ affect how we approach day-to-day -day life? Um, we are... Uh, we are to be thankful and praise God and live our lives to His glory. Right? And I'm not always successful at that. My worst times are in the car in traffic. <laughs> uh, but, um, uh, but, uh, but I strive for it every day. And every day after my Bible study, I say, okay, I'm going to try again. I'm going to try again today. <laughs> But, uh, and, and also, uh, we want people, I, I, I'm not a public speaker, as you can see, and I'm not, I have a hard time finding the words unless somebody asks me how to just approach uh, a person and talk about my faith. I can do that if they ask me, but they'll only ask me if they see something different in me, if they see something different. So when we're set apart as God's children and as God's people, the current culture needs to see something different in us. And then they'll ask, what is this joy and peace that you have amidst all of this chaos? You know? Through the Holy Spirit, I have God's presence and power right here. And it makes me think about Joshua. You know how he said to Joshua, Do not fear. Do not fear. Be courageous and bold. And we should too. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yes. Um, I just the only thing I disagree with you with is you made a mistake that you're not a public speaker. You are. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, that's Thank very you. that's very kind of you. I did a lot of praying before this. I will have to say that uh, when I finished my prayer, I got up and looked out my kitchen window, and uh, there was an albino squirrel. Wow. I know. And I went, gee, God, thank you. <laughs> and then there was a cardinal in the tree outside the window, which, you know, I don't know if you guys sort of know the, the symbolism of cardinals in this day and age, but it's kind of like a, a sign from those people, people who have departed. So I went, I'm teaching today, Dad. <laughs> Look down on me a little bit. I, it is important to me, it is important to me when I teach to try to I pray that God will speak through me. And I do say, I have certain phrases. My latest one is, um, what, what, did, what did I just say two or three times? I'll say, okay. Did you hear me? And then I'll say, uh, I say, as a matter of fact, or um, I don't know, you know. But my si my sister's real good at pointing that out. Like, I don't know where you heard that, but it's kind of stuck. <laughs> but anyway, I appreciate it very much. And I give, go I give God and the Lord Jesus and the Holy Spirit all the glory. I want you to know that. Thank you. Because they help me. <laughs> And I'm sure your father would be very, very pleased. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie. And thank you, Bill. And oh my, we were missing our music department. We don't sound any better. 
But we have a lot of enthusiasm when we say, so that's okay. Um, just a few reminders. Um, we did decide to go ahead and um, send $25 gift certificates for the children that are living at Madison Ranch at Christmas time. Um, and I did check. They presently have nine, and so I'm anticipating that number goes up a little bit by the holidays. Um, so let's put our class together and provide 12 $25 gift certificates. And if we could bring them in the next couple of weeks, Bill will collect them and we'll send them off to um, the ranch. I might suggest Walmart and um, Target are both available and close to Madison Ranch, so that would be ideal for children. Um, our Christmas celebration will be Sunday, uh, December 11th, and Amy is putting together a suggested price. Um, our menu will be very much as it has been in the last years. We'll have beef and salmon, um, assorted <coughs> salads, appetizers, special potatoes, and I, I've asked Amy to um, give us an estimate for price with and without desserts. Um, I thought we could bring a number of desserts, um, and that would save her from doing it too. So anyway, put it on your calendar. I will be sending out a notice. Uh, Caring Hands uh, is meeting tomorrow at 12.15, and Rebecca Circle is putting together their shoe boxes um, for distribution. Um, uh, Pat suggested that any of you that would like to, they are doing a hands-on prayers for our three ministers out in front of the church this morning before the 11 o'clock service. So, Bill, you want to leave us laughing? <laughs> Time may prevent that a little bit. We're... <laughs> Jimmy John, a boy from Kentucky, many years ago, received a letter in the mail from his local draft board and he did not want to be drafted but he knew he had to so the first day at camp he kept going around looking on the ground and the piece of paper he'd pick it up look at it no pick it up look at it and the drill sergeant was really worried about it because everything he walked by was paper, he picked it up, looked at it, and said no. So the drill sergeant called the captain and said, we've got a guy I think is, you know, a little bit off in the head. He's probably crazier than a mouse that resides in an outside outhouse. But the captain said, well, we'll send him to the psychiatrist. So he went to the psychiatrist's office and as soon as he went in there, the receptionist he went up to the desk, took every piece of paper, turned it over and said, no, nope, this isn't it. Well, the psychiatrist called him in his office and he did the same thing. Started taking all the papers on the psychiatrist's desk and said, nope, this isn't it. Well, the psychiatrist said, I guess this guy needs to be some discharged on a section eight, which is a being crazy. So, he wrote the discharge, handed the guy, said, go check out. The guy looked at the paper, this is it. There's a long stand. And before I dismiss you, think of this. Friday is November the 11th, yes. which was originally Armistice Day, right. but we honor those who served at that time, and especially those who gave the ultimate sacrifice. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in my sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Amy and her husband are here today. Well, yay! yay. <laughs> Amy is a regular member, but we miss her, but we see her every Wednesday. I know.
Yeah. And she brings wonderful gifts. And her husband, and we have those wonderful filet mignons. He is the cook. And we thank